recording as well. So, um, welcome everybody. Uh, this is another session of The Filmmaker's Life. And uh, my name is Joanne Butcher. I think most of you who are on here already know me. Um, I am so excited to introduce today uh, Sergio Hiral. He is an amazing uh, director and uh, writer. And um, he is in Miami and I am in Missoula, Montana. So um, we're going to uh, get going in a couple of minutes. But actually, uh, before we start, I would like to uh, show you all a trailer from one of Sergio's films, Maria Antonia. And Sergio, um, this was, I believe, the last film that you made before you left Cuba. Is that correct? Yes, that's the last film. The last film. Yeah. Can, can you tell us a, a little bit about the film before I show the clip? Well, the film is based on a play. And, um, and as a matter of fact, Armando Dorey was the one who made the, the film, the film um, the script, I mean, the adaptation to, to, the, to the screen. And um, it, it's, it is, uh, it's set in the, let's say, the late 50s, before the uh, so-called revolution, I mean, before the um, Castro. This, before Castro. And, uh, yeah, and it's, um, it, it's a story on, on Yoruba religion, you know, which is the applicant. Uh, religion that, it, that, it, uh, that they practice, some people practice in Cuba. And it's a more than a drama, it's like a, it's a, like a tragedy uh, among people who live in, um, in the bottom line of society. But as I said, it was said in the 50s. It's set in the 50s. In That's Havana. very important to understand that. Yes, right. yes. It's set in Havana, Cuba in the 50s. OK, so uh, I'm going to share my screen and show this clip. Hold on, hold on. Aquí se va a decir lo que pasó. Maria Antonia! Maria Antonia! Estaba en cana. <ríe> Qué batino. Eso es lo que muchos quisieran. Pero todavía hay María Antonia para rato. ¿Qué te pasa? ¿Qué te pasa? ¿Cuál de tus putas te amarró como un perro? Oye, oye, ¿qué coño te vas a estar loca? Oye, para ahí. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah, go to Caru, who yeah, yeah.
um, oh dear. I'm having technology difficulties today. So, um, Maria Antonia was the last film that Sergio made in uh, Cuba, and it's set in the 1950s, and it takes place before uh, Castro came in. Um, but I want to go back uh, before that and ask you, Sergio, when was the first time that you knew that you wanted to be a filmmaker? Were you young? Were you in college? When did you decide, I want to be a filmmaker? Well, um, I have to tell a story about, about films of my life. Yes. Otherwise, yeah. My parents, I'm an only child. It's very important because my parents love uh, uh, movies. They, they, they love to go to movies. And they didn't, and they didn't have a place where to leave me when they had to say they, they took me. And by that, by that time, they were not like a you know, restriction of age. So I've been seeing films since I remember. And that was part of my life, films. And um, living in New York, I met a uh, um, Hollywood DP, Nestor Almendros. Ah, yes. Very famous. Yes. Uh -huh. Blue Lagu Lagu. Um, and he told me that in Cuba uh, was uh, like a new film industry, brand new man. And they were looking for people who knew about films. Hmm. So I said, let's go. <laughs> That's How old were you? How old were you at that time? <laughs> 20, 21. Uh-huh, 21. Don't, okay. don't have <laughs> <laughs> And uh, what was the, the first thing that you did um, with film? What was the first experience you had? Well, I started working on... Uh, like that documentaries, you know, documentaries um, sort of industrial or agricultural process. Uh, they were very short. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's the way I learned, you know, and they, they were used to instruct uh, uh -huh. other people, you know, and it was very simple. But I started to develop them step by step and show things that the direct, the, the institute direct, uh, director found out uh, that I was working in a, in a crea creative way. And um, so later on, they gave an opportunity to start working as a, uh, director assistant hmm. and also as a document like documentaries hmm. when it was the beginning that's that's very interesting to me yeah. that you Later start on, uh... go ahead sorry go Say ahead i was going to say it's interesting to me that you started as a documentary filmmaker because in your feet in your fiction films in the feature films there's very much a quality of realism and a documentary feel to a lot of your work I think For that, but maybe, maybe because that's my my, my school, no documentaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were the document uh, were the documentaries um, very much about uh, Cuban people, ordinary people? Was that was that the kind of documentaries that you made? At the beginning, as I told you, they were made to instruct, uh, uh, like. Uh, 
workers and peace, how to do things. Yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. In, in, in the, how to, yeah, some technical processes like that. Right, right. And later on, I start to make my own documentaries mm. because I have, I have about ten um, art art documentaries. You know, uh, they were my, my own documentaries, and actually that's the way I I worked. Uh, um, what was some of, yeah, right. what were some of those documentaries about? Do you remember what what did you make documentaries about? Different, 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 different kind of documentaries. I'm not I, I, I'm not prepared with. Her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just taking you way back. So I don't remember it. Way, way so back, we'll way back. <laughs> Armando, Armando, come and say hello. No, no, it's okay. Marroni, Cairo Blue. No, no, no. 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 Cecilia Valdez, de Gonzalo Roy. Yeah. Say, uh, there were too many. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But they, they, they were different kind of, you know. Like uh, some of them were completely art. Some of them were more social. Yes, yes. You know? Well, uh, um, yeah, but a lot of them. Yeah. What was the uh, first fiction that you made? The first feature film uh, that you made? Yeah, the first one it was the other Francisco. Can you tell can yeah, you tell yeah. us about that one? Can you tell us a little bit about that one? Yeah. Uh, the, every time it's, it's a little bit possibly tough against the slaves. There was a, a writer who, who wrote a novel. Uh, against slavery, but it was a very romantic novel. Uh, I mean, very important because he was expressing his feeling against the slavery, but from a very romantic point of view. So I read that, that, that novel and I said to myself, well, this is it's very precious, you know, but that's not the whole reality. So it came to my mind to make a film where I show the, the novel and and I show the way it, it really was. And also, although it's fiction, it got to be with documentary structure, you know. Yeah. Not the other Francisco. The other Francisco. Okay, I'm going to show a clip of um, the other Francisco. Um, because there's some echo that I'm getting, um, because this film is probably in my top 10 favorite best films of all time. And um, really, absolutely. Sergio, you didn't know that. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to show a clip of this. Um, this clip is in the middle of the film, uh, so, but, but it shows the technique where Sergio took this novel and um, I don't know what that echo is, um, and um, I think you're going to have to come off your computer. Um, and. Uh, There's a novel that was written in the 18th century, and some of the film shows the story of the novel. Some of the film shows the um, time of the novel and about the writer, about the novelist, and some of the film shows about life as it really was lived at that time by the slaves that the novel was about. It's a very complex structure, but I'm just going to show you this piece so that you can get a little idea of, of what the film is. 
So I'm going to share my screen. And you can see this whole film on YouTube. You can either choose one with much better quality image than this one that has no English subtitles, or this one. The, the image is very degraded, but it has the English subtitles. So I wanted to play that. All right. En cuanto a Francisco, por orden expresa de Ricardo, no había recibido ningún género de castigo desde que la mulata lo visitara en su habitación. Desde aquel día, Dorotea no había visto más a Francisco, pero en vísperas de su regreso a La Habana, fue a despedirse de él. La base de esta novela es el triángulo pasional que provoca el trágico final de Francisco. Pero, ¿acaso esta actitud corresponde a un esclavo típico de la época? ¿Podía Francisco haber actuado solamente por amor a Dorotea? El propio autor nos dejó suficiente documentación para responder estas preguntas. Señor Suárez Romero, ¿cuándo comenzó usted a escribir su libro? En septiembre del año pasado, durante mi estancia en Puentes Grandes. Luego, por razones económicas, he tenido que trasladarme con mi familia para el ingenio, donde la he terminado. Un ingenio de su propiedad, supongo. Pertenece a mi familia, pero su administración está en manos de acreedores. Pero es allí donde mejor he podido estudiar las costumbres que nacen de la esclavitud. Siendo usted de dueño de esclavos, ¿cómo es que no se dio cuenta antes de esa situación? Siempre he estado cerca de esa terrible realidad, pero entonces era muy joven para conseguir tanta desgracia. Considerando la rígida censura española, ¿dónde pretende usted editar? Por el momento, espero que circule entre aquellas personas susceptibles a mejorar su conducta con los esclavos. ¿Cree usted que Francisco es un esclavo típico? No, de ninguna forma. ¿Quién que gima bajo el yugo de la esclavitud puede ser tan manso, tan apacible como Francisco? Francisco es un fenómeno, una excepción singular que me ayuda a denunciar los horrores de la esclavitud por contraste con la crueldad de los amos. Verá usted, siempre he querido que la vida de todos se deslice serena y apacible, sin jamás escuchar un sollozo, un suspiro de dolor. Y como mi carácter es amigo de soportar con paciencia la desgracia, vine a colocarme en lugar de Francisco, dotándole de esa mansedumbre y esa resignación cristiana tan difícil de encontrar en la esclavitud. Suárez Romero reconoce que Francisco es una excepción singular, que la imagen de un esclavo manso y resignado no es típica de la esclavitud. Pero entonces... ¿Cómo entender el regocijo con que es recibida la novela en la tertulia de Del Monte? ¿Es posible que detrás de las buenas intenciones de Suárez Romero y algún que otro sincero antiesclavista, se movieran los intereses de clase que no solo perseguían, con la imagen ideal del esclavo, mejorar la conducta de los amos? ¿Es posible que los verdaderos objetivos de los ideólogos burgueses y el imperio británico en suprimir el tráfico de negros no fueran puramente filantrópicos? Tomemos la novela Francisco como punto de partida para conocer la situación real de la esclavitud y la imagen verdadera del esclavo en un ingenio de la época. Yo no 
sé por qué todos ustedes los totices tienen alas tan largas. <risa> Solo piensan en volar, en volar. No, negro, tú te levantas cuando yo te hablo, ¿me oíste? Mira. Tú vas a coger tu buen cuadrazo, tu brillete y tu cencerro. Vas a ver dónde te metes. Y cada vez que tú me veas a mí, o algún capataz de la finca, tú vas a decir quién eres. Yo soy Crispín. El que se huyó para el monte, el cimarrón. Y eso es para que no se te olvide, ¿sabes? Y para que no se me olvide a mí tampoco. Um, I, w I wanted to show that long clip so that we could see uh, some of all three levels of the storytelling. So the first one, in the first one, we're seeing the story of the act in the novel, which as Sergio called it, a romantic, it was a very romantic idea where a house slave and a field slave fell in love and it's romanticized in this 18th century novel. And then we have this documentary, <laughs> documentary with a journalist interviewing the novelist. And then we have a much more realistic version of slave life in Cuba in the 18th century. Um, yeah, no, that is certainly one of my top 10 films of all time, Sergio. What um, what do you think? Um, how do you think it would? Uh, what what do you want to say about that film now that you look back on it? I know it's a long time ago now. Disco, you mean? Yes. What do yeah, you think? Okay. Uh, what? Well, uh, as, as a matter of fact. Uh, that's exactly the, the, what happened with my, the way I, I, um, I, I worked before for many years as a documentary, make a documentary. So my first film had to do with doc documentaries, documentaries too. Uh, you just say it because I show the first part, that's the novel, which is a very romantic novel, as uh, almost as as Hollywood film from the fifties, uh, yes, no, yes, very rom romantic atmosphere. And then I tell the, the same story all over again, but from a different perspective, with reality, we are, and I use more of, of a documentary uh, way of doing it, showing that as part of reality. Of real, of real life. Yeah. That's a provision. That's what I, what I did in that film. And um, the, uh, when I, when I uh, first met you and first learned about your work, I was told that all of your films that you made in Cuba told the entire history of Afro-Cubans in Cuba. Is, is that the way you see your work? Um, my first three films, uh, the, actually I call it a trilogy. Uh -huh. Oh, not me. Some other people have, now some other critics have decided it's the trilogy. A trilogy. <laughs> really for the purpose of it. Yeah, trilogy, you know. Yeah, that different aspects of, of slavery because I, that was something forgotten. Uh, it's very, very, very uh, strange how uh, in Cuba and the Caribbean Highlands, you know, where slavery was so tough. Uh, you know, the past of that people forgot. They, they don't remember. They, they didn't remember why, or they didn't care about why. 
And so that's it's uh, that uh, maybe the black people who, who yeah, because they fall out of uh, they 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 have forgotten why. Well, and, and for me, it was very important to, to show that. And that's why I made those three films. Uh, all about slavery, yeah. Um, go ahead. The other two are El Rancheador and Maluala. 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 Yes. So here's slave another hunter and slave hunter and Malwala. Yes. So um, the, here's another thing, Sergio, that maybe I never told you. So when I first met you, met you, um, it was uh, when I was working at Miami Dade Community College, and you had just arrived in America, and we showed a, a series of your films. We showed all six of your films, and. Um, I was kind of the MC, you know, I was supposed to do the question and answer after the film. Well, the first film that we showed, which maybe was the other Francisco, I could not speak. And what I realized afterwards was that it was the first time that I had seen on screen the history of, of my people. So my family, my father comes from Trinidad and Tobago. It's not exactly Cuba, but mm -hmm. to see uh, what slavery looked like in the 18th century in the Caribbean, that is my people. And so there was no Q and A because I couldn't talk, you know. And I feel as though uh, one of the reasons I find film is so important is because what happened to me that when I saw the film was that I saw myself, I saw my history for the very first time. And I think that that's one of the things that's so important about your work because we don't see very much of black history, especially not back into slavery on the screen. So um, I just wanted to say that was the impact it had on me to see the films. And then, I don't know if you remember this, but then you gave me a reading list and I, I read all these books about slavery and I often tell people it was like I got a master's degree in comparative slavery. And I learned about the differences in slavery between, say, the US and the different islands in the Caribbean. And uh, what I learned about um, Cuban slavery was that they had a very different approach and their um, practice was that they decided to hold on uh, they, they held on the longest um, when slavery was ab abolished, when abolition was coming, they held on the longest and they decided to um, have a practice where all slaves would, would be gone. There would be no black people in the island was kind of the idea. And uh, they worked the slaves to death. And um, if you go on YouTube, you can find a copy of El Otro Fran Francisco. And I think that it's, um, it's very hard to watch, but the um, uh, but the um, the history that's in there and the truth that's in there about slavery and particularly Cuban slavery is is really really um, powerful. So thank you for that. So you kept making films in Cuba, and um, what was that like? Was was there really a community of people who worked together? I know you're still friends with many of them. You mean in, well, in, in the institute or just in general with filmmakers? Because okay. I, I yeah. know that you've kept in touch with so many mm. Cuban uh, filmmakers. Well, at, at, the, at the beginning of, of Castro's uh, to power, I mean, um, support revolution. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, 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 a person who 
was part of the of the whole movement that right away right away just maybe in the first year he created the film institute oh. yeah and um it didn't exist before Cuban films were very films were very important people love films uh there was a lot a, 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 a very long um, uh, they love the Hollywood films. Hmm. There was a lot of cinemas or cinema houses in Havana. In every town there was a, a cinema house and a lot of um, Hollywood films and also Mexican or Argentinian. The yeah. The thirties. Yeah. This guy, uh, Alfredo Guevara, he loved films and he, he had the power to do it in a new uh, society, let's call it that way. And and he created the, the, the Film Institute with uh, a couple of, I may say with a couple of, of people that made out to make films uh, like Nestor Almendros or some, or, you know, there was a DP or some others and and with maybe with everyone who wanted to make me one of them, they were myself, you know, <laughs> because people were not used to it. I mean, there was, and that was just the beginning. It was very beautiful. The whole movement was very beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and then he grew up, and we, uh, and, you know, with the pass of time, we start to to be recognized and to get um, awards in, in international festivals and all that. And the Cuban film, is, the, the Cuban film industry uh, began, to, you know, to be recognized, uh, to become important, until. Uh, well, the, I don't want to talk about politics, but uh, no, no. if you talk about Cuba, I have to do it. Yes, it's true. It's until true. the, uh, until the, uh, this is the way I look at things. Uh, until Castro died, and the whole thing collapsed. That's my mm. point of view. And, and you know, and finally, the 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 institution disappeared. Ah. Uh. And it doesn't exist. Oh, 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 it doesn't? I don't think I knew that. Okay. Well, yeah, it, it, it does, but they don't make films. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I mean, you know, like, like before, there was a, a different moment. Yes. Uh, I'm not there. I don't know exactly what happened, but that's what happened. Uh, and um, so some of the film directors, they made their independent. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, they, yes. they were about the, yeah, but the, institu the institution uh, uh, as an industry disappeared. Uh -huh. Right. So I, that's the way I look at it. So, what was the year that you came to Miami? What year was that? What year did you come to Miami? In, 90, in 1991. 91. Okay. Yes. So you came to Miami and you just had VHS copies of your films, right? They were originally shot on 35. It's sorry, I didn't hear you well. Sorry, you, you, left, you came to Miami and you just had VHS copies of the films because oh, the, yeah, the, the, the 35 millimeter prints are still in Cuba somewhere. Yeah, but uh, I don't, uh, that, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yes, yes. So when you came to Miami, we sh I remember we showed your films, and then you and I put together um, a series where we we showed we called it Made in USA, and we brought together uh, twenty four Cuban directors who lived in America. Yeah, that was fun, Sergio. Yeah, a lot of fun. <laughs> Lot of fun, really. <laughs> and I see to that today you still keep in connection with many of uh, those people who who all 
have left Cuba and, and are living in the US or around the world. And uh, you, you still know some of those directors and the ones who are alive, I guess. You still keep in touch with them? The most important one, they, they die. Ah, uh, yeah. They, 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 yeah, they die. Some of them are gone. Like, like, um, I mean, I know it, I, that's the, the, the name we use for him, which I believe is the most important Cuban film director, Tomás Gutierrez Alea. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah I, well, he died a few years ago. And um, I keep in touch with not many, because I don't, uh, not, not, not many nowadays through, you know, internet or things like that, you know. Not personally, there is, none of them are here in, um, in Miami or in, in Miami. the States or out of Cuba. The, uh, no, some of them are out of Cuba in, in, in different countries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, when we did our program, uh, we brought uh, Leoni Chasso. Leoni Chasso, I think, is still working in. But, but Leoni Chasso is, is a film make, filmmaker uh, of, of the States, made in the States. Yes, yes. He was a younger generation, yeah, yeah. I think, much younger. Yes, he, yeah, he, yeah. You're talking about the people from from the from the Ikaik, from the Ikaik, Ikaik. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so when you came to Miami, I think that um, it was a big surprise uh, that you were used to making these big films, and you started to make films again in Miami with no money, no support, no, no, nothing behind you. Um, why do you think that you were able to continue making films? How did you do that? You had no money. How did you do it? <clears throat> well, oh, Armando left. <laughs> he helped me a lot. <laughs> yeah. Very, very tough. Very tough. And... Uh, and very sad because you spend your money and sometimes you don't, you know, you don't get it back. You don't get anything back. Well, you get something, but not, uh, it's very tough. Um, just by, by trying to do it, doing it and uh, look for people who, who cares, who, who are willing to work, maybe for learning, for exercising, uh but they, they won't get paid or maybe uh, because i promise if this film or this is going somewhere we you are going to pay you back never happened up to now which was the um, uh which was the first film you made in miami which was the first one uh i actually made uh, began to make documentaries all over again. Mm -hmm. And uh, the real first one is Two Times Anna. That was the, the last one, wasn't it? The last feature that you made? Dos yeah, veces Anna? Yes. But before yeah. you made in Invisible Color, you made Chronicles of an Ordinance. Um, I don't know what else, but yeah, you made uh, a couple of documentaries. No, no, I made few documentaries. I mean, I mean, feature film, feature films. I only made, I made one. Oh yeah, yes. I made many. Oh yeah, I made many documentaries here. It's pocket, it's pocket money. Oh, because no, no one here in Miami, no one wants to invest money <laughs> on independent films. So you have to use your own money and, and people who don't want to get paid. That's the formula. There is another one. 
when when you made chronicles of an ordinance i think that there's also another reason that people make films if there's no money which is they have a, a real passion for a cause and a message that needs to be told why did you make chronicles of an ordinance okay let me see let me see why did i make okay because The, uh, okay, I'm sorry, thank you. Because the, um, let, 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 me, let, let me reconstruct the, 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 the Cronica, eh, una ordenanza fue por la... Por la ordenanza gay que se levantó en Miami. Oh, okay, for the, 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 oh, the civil rights. For the gay, for the gay, for the gay and lesbian civil rights in Miami that they, they didn't exist, so there was a whole movement. And and it seemed to be very, very interesting to you to, to you know to to have it to have um apparently they they, they got it, you know, the, the civil rights in, in Miami for gay and lesbian. They didn't exist before. Right. And yeah. I, I, I wasn't any part of the of the movement. I just really care about the, the, the moment, what was happening. Exactly. There was this historic moment where the LGBT community in Miami was fighting for civil rights and you decided to document that process. And it turned out to be such an important uh, moment in history. Um, you know that that you did that and so i think that's what i was saying that i think there's another reason that people make films when there's no money is because there's something so important that needs to be discussed or or documented or or talked about exactly. and then what is the invisible color about i just ordered that one by the way from art matter and films so i don't have my copy yet but what is the invisible color about? The invisible color. Invisible color. Invisible color. color. Uh, invisible color is part of it's, it's, it's part of treating reality, social reality. Um, okay, we have to talk about politics because we are in Miami. We Cubans have to talk about politics. No way out. <laughs> uh, the Cuban exile here in Miami, most of them, you know, hundred thousand of them, even even. Two million of them lived in Miami, in Florida. Most of all in Miami, but in Florida. Okay, and the uh, the majority, historic point, historical point of view, the majority of, of, of exile came to to the states for many years. They were like upper class, middle class, and they were white. And black people, uh, you know, they remain in, 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 in Cuba. Let's say for the very, for the first, maybe uh, 20 years. Do you see me? Yes, 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 I can see you. I can hear you. <laughs> okay, because I see myself now. Yeah, oh. Uh, but, I'm but here, first, I'm here. <laughs> All right, all right, for the first seven years. And then slowly the black people start to, to come in different ways. And of course, uh, nowadays you have many black people, a lot of them, a thousand of them living in here in Miami, but uh, people don't recognize it, they don't know. So I have to talk about politics the way out. <laughs> so the, uh, yeah. The Cuban uh, exile uh, lived the white, 
Everybody's going, no, there are all kinds of people, all kinds of Cubans. And that's why I made the documentary about that reality. I mean, uh, 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 it's, it's a visible color because it's, it's we, we hear, but uh, we are not when we transparent. It, it, it up from the, that, that, that was the purpose. Yes, it's uh, the the sociological issue is that the C Cuban community in Miami is very powerful, extremely powerful, lots of money and power. And it's considered a white community, whereas in fact, millions of Miami, uh, of Cubans living in Miami are black. Um, but they tend to be hit invisible and, and sort of treated as somehow separate. And so the invisible color is about that. And I put the uh, link in the chat there so that people can buy that from Art Matter and Films. Um, so, um, and then, uh, so you made some documentaries and then you made Dos Veces Ana, which uh, you showed me a couple of years, a few years ago. It's a very, very fun comedy. I think that must be your first comedy. <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, about this fabulous young woman who works in a supermarket and um, all kinds of adventures happen in the supermarket. Um, but I, 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 well, how long ago did you make that film? How long, how old is uh, Dos Veces Ana? Dos Veces Ana. In Two thousand twelve. Two thousand and twelve. Uh, eight, eight years. Yes. Okay. Eight years ago. And and the last time that I saw you both in Miami, uh, Sergio and Armando, who is hiding, um, <laughs> you told me you had retired. Is that true, or are you going to make another film? I told you I, I, I wanted to, or I no, was you, going to. No, you told me you had retired. You were retired. retired. Yes. Is that true? No, it's not. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's a self-retirement because I don't have money to make, to make another film. That's why. Uh -huh. I have to retire. I retire myself. <laughs> <laughs> if if you had some money, you would make another film then. So you're not. Oh, I have a script. I have the script. It's called Which Red one? Tide. Red, Red Tide. Red Tide. Red Tide. Yeah. It's oh. a, uh, yeah. What is it about? It is about um. Uh, love. Love. Love uh, and it, 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 it's a it, it, it's a script. It, it, uh, I, don't, I won't tell you the whole story, but tell you about there are only uh, five, two, four, five, six characters in the film, and had to do with love relation with marriage, with. Um, Acceptance of, of, of the differences that they came out of, on, a, on a love relation. Yeah. And it's there. The script is there, but. <laughs> so, so maybe, maybe we have somebody on the call who is very rich and who has money and wants to make a film with you. <laughs> Oh yeah, and, and, oh yeah. Yeah, maybe we maybe we have somebody rich on the call, and they and then Sergio will come out of retirement and make another film. Yes, whatever you want, whatever you want. <laughs> well, in I like to in the last ten minutes, I like to see if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask you, and uh, it's always easier for me if you raise your hand and, and ask the question. Um, does anybody have any questions they would like to ask? It's a golden opportunity. 
And if nobody asks a question, John, yes, yes, yes. I can always count on my clients to be the brave ones to ask the question. Yes, go ahead, John. John is from Trinidad. John is in, in Trinidad. Okay, fine. The, the, the wonders of technology. Hi. Hi to you. My name is, my name is John. And I'm from Trinidad. And um, I am now, for the first time, getting to see you, know you. I, I don't know any of your work or anything like that. But when I, when I saw the film, um, it, it piqued my interest immediately because of what Joanne mentioned about, um, because here, here in the Caribbean, we, we don't have any type of, of archival footage about how slavery was in, in the Caribbean. And so we don't have any visual representation of that history. So when I saw your film, I immediately felt very much connected to my history, even though it happened in Cuba, because Trinidad is part of the Caribbean. Okay. And, and I also have Spanish heritage. My last name is Viscunia. Right, so I also am mixed with with Venezuelan and possibly Cuban. Who knows? I don't know because I am mixed with everything. So my question is: the possibility of receiving some. I know this is a crazy question, but the possibility of receiving uh, um, some of your some of your 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 footage for. Um, for a fee or, or, or whatever to, in, to be inserted in a documentary that I'm making about, about Soka um, because we are going far back as Calypso um, because Calypso, which is Calypso music, which basically is a, is a genre of music that was invented by slaves, right? Um, and, and that is the way how they they expressed themselves um, in the form of music. So while they were slaves back in the 1800s, um, they used to come together um, here in Trinidad and they would mimic and imitate their slave owners. So they formed a music that is called Calypso, which became very, very popular in Trinidad in the 1900s, 1800s and 1900s which basically is an expression of our culture up to this day. And, not, and, and that also transcended into soca. So Jonathan, John, I'm, I'm going to translate the question. Yeah. So yeah. Jonathan, in his documentary that he is making about music in Trinidad, is having great difficulty finding um, historic archival footage from the 30s and earlier and he was asking if he could ask you to use footage from your film for his film uh, take them from my films i mean take thing uh, but actually you, you know um these are no those films are not mine right right yeah, the Cuban films. Yeah, um, yeah. I, you, but I, if you precisely want something particular, you let me know, and I am going to try to, you know, uh, that's something that that should be made. I mean, but I let's do it. <laughs> great, okay. great, great, great. Thank you. I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you. But also, John, um, what I want to say is that particularly in, like in El, El Otro Francisco that we looked at, Sergio created all of that. There's no, archi there's no such thing as archival footage from the times exactly. of slavery. Yes, e yeah. yes, exactly. But it is, it is the closest thing. Uh -huh. It is the closest thing that, and, and, and because obviously it will be, it will be, it will be said and mentioned in the documentary that I'm making. And yeah. it will be the closest representation yes. uh, that exists here in the Caribbean. Yes, I think so. I think that's true. Okay, I'll put you two together, collaboration.
And and when okay. John is when John is rich, he's gonna make make your film, Sergio. <laughs> yeah, but I said I said I, I, I uh, me personally, I don't care. I, I, you know, but uh, I repeat, the, the films are in mine. I mean, they, don't, they don't belong to me. Yeah, yep. they belong to to yep. Cuba. Cuba. To, to Cuba. Yes. 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 Does anybody have any uh, another question? Let's do one more question. Something about writing is what I was thinking might be a good question. Maggie. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Oh, Eugene. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, I think you are too young to retire. I don't understand <laughs> unless you have nothing else to say. I myself am too old to retire. <laughs> and I have the belief when I am writing that the st that film is a very young industry. It is only a little over 100 years old. And it has not reached its potential. And uh, I feel that we who believe that it can change the world must help it to reach its potential. And uh, I, I cannot give up, even though my father was a silent film actor. So I'm not as young as I look. <laughs> I mean, I'm not young. <laughs> but I can't give up, and I keep on making films. So I think it's very important. And also, we have a saying in an organization that I formed many years ago. It doesn't take money to make movies. It takes talent with passion and a dream. Thank you, Eugene. So don't give up. So don't give up. <laughs> more films, more films. <laughs> Maggie. More important films. More important. <laughs> Maggie, do you have a question? Uh, what is your inspiration? Uh, what, what, um, what inspires you to get up in the morning and, and want to create more? Um, say somebody writes you a check for a million dollars, even five hundred thousand dollars. What what is your inspiration um, and motivation at at this stage? For okay, one um, sorry. Um, what is your inspiration? What is your inspiration to keep working and keep making movies? What is your inspiration? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> that's a big question. That's, that, that, that's a question. What's, what's the inspiration is? What is your inspiration? What inspires you to keep writing? Well, uh, for me, films is like uh, breathing. It's uh, need air to keep alive. I need to breathe. And uh, like I need to eat to be alive, eat. A and, true artist, you know, a true artist. Because I hear you very far. That's why I. Yeah, that's why I'm translating because he can hear me through this mic better. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mark, do you have a question? Um, actually, I, I don't have a, a question. I just want to say that the, the, scene, the, the film that we just viewed was just incredibly moving and, and compassionate and, and the, the reality of the, of the, the characters uh, as, and the horrible, horrible conditions uh, of that situation we, we just really profoundly moved me that's all i can say and and thank you because it's it's really important that people see what that really was and is so thank you thank you <laughs> well we've come to 
the end of our hour. Um, if you would like to talk to me about working with me, I just put my link in the in the chat. And I posted some more information about Sergio. The, if you go onto YouTube, you can find uh, at least two or three of, of his films. Um, El Otro Francisco, The Other Francisco, uh, Ranchiador, and I'm not sure about Maria Antonia, but um, uh, El Otro Francisco, there was definitely one with English subtitles. And I have some people on here who speak Spanish as well, so uh, you can find them within Spanish. But uh, Sergio, I want to thank you so much. It's so good to see you. I wish that Armando would come and say hello. Or goodbye. <laughs> Ask Armando to come and say goodbye. Hello. Armando! <laughs> I contribute contribution with the, the interview. Thank you so much for you. And for Sergio, it's a very important moment. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Actually, he's, he's my producer nowadays. Oh, I know, Armando. I know. And he's a wonderful you know. screenwriter as well. Yes, yeah, so if you want to make if you want to make Sergio's film, you're going to need to talk to Armando. <laughs> <Of course. laughs> but thank you so much, Sergio, for coming on and joining us today from Miami. And uh, thank you, everybody, for being on. And I know that the technology was a bit eh, today, but um, so thank you again okay. and goodbye, thank everybody. You. Bye, bye, bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Thank you for your contribution with the culture <laughs> of Miami, of the black, of the white, of the moment. <laughs> oh my God. Joanne? Oh. Joanne, can I ask you a question? Yes, who is this? Oh, is this Eugene? Uh, Eugene, yes. Yes. Would you like a, to have a small part in my upcoming film? Me? Yes. Me? Yes. Oh, I don't know. Do you yes. want me on a set? No, you don't have to be on the set. It's virtual. <laughs> no. you, will be, you will be in a Zoom call. Oh, the okay. Set. All right. Like All right. Yes, absolutely. The philosophy of film. I would like yeah. you to be yeah. in our yeah. film. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. Okay. Let's talk Bye. about it later. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.